All right. Let's go ahead. If you have your Bible, and I hope you do, um, if you would turn to uh, Ephesians chapter 2. That is going to be our principal text this morning. If you do not have a Bible, do not panic. It will be on the screen as well. We've got a brand new green, fresh media team in the booth. And make sure to tell them they did a fantastic job today. Like, go ahead and, yeah. Go ahead and, and tip them and invite them out to lunch. And anytime, any, but anytime anybody's back there, always, always give them a hug and do all that sort of stuff. As long as they're okay with that. Don't, like, force them to hug you or anything. That'd be weird. All right. So we're in Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to start re- reading in verse 1. If you would read along with me. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, too, we all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus." For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. Verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. So on Sunday mornings, we've read this several times. In several different sermons, in several different contexts, we've read this passage. And there's good reason for it. Because the book of Ephesians as a whole, and particularly this chunk, is written with teaching in mind. And I think that's, that's pretty profound. That's pretty special. And it hits so many landmarks, so to speak, in the gospel message that this is defining so many things that are necessary to understand about our relationship with the Lord, our relationship with the God of the universe. And that cannot be read enough. I, I, I don't think we can exhaust the public reading of scripture, period. But especially passages like this offer so much important theology, so much important consideration. The reason I read this today is I believe there's something here that's underlying, that's maybe a little less obvious, that is also necessary in our understanding of the gospel message. And there's this, there's this phrase, tell me if you've heard it with a nod or a grunt or a yes, whatever. It's not a religion. It's a re- relationship. Have you ever heard that before? Those of you who didn't just pre, predetermine what I was going to say. Have you ever heard that? You can talk back to me. That's really good. Okay. I can recall the very first time I heard this. I did not grow up in church or anything like that. And I can recall hearing this and thinking, that is pretty cool. That sounds pretty neat. I, I came to know Jesus as a teenager without really any faith background or anything like that. I only had been to church uh, for funerals, and, <laughs> and, uh, and I was young, and, and mis- I understood nothing. And so I remember encountering Jesus, and, and saying yes, and giving my life to him, and being super cool with the idea of being religious, because that's just what I thought it was. That's what I thought um, I was doing. And so I remember even telling the people that I would like sit at the lunch table with, and being like, hey, just so you know, I'm Gonna, gonna do Jesus stuff, and I'm gonna become religious. And it's funny now, looking back on that, whatever, however many, 10, 12 years ago, and uh, I remember this one kid being like, whatever, that's fine. Just don't be like that Nate kid, because it controls his life, and he's a crazy person. And that's Pastor Nate, who's the lead pastor of this church. Um, and I just remember thinking like, oh, okay, yeah, sure. 
And, and I remember just thinking like, all right, now that I have a, a little Gideon uh, New Testament and Psalms and Proverbs, and, and I've said yes to Jesus, I'm a religious person. And I go to youth group, and it was like maybe the second time I've been to youth group, and they're like, there's the youth pastor is wearing this shirt with like a cross uh, scratched out, and it says, no religion or something like that. I was like, what is going on? <laughs> I'm so confused. And he's like, it's not about religion. It's about relationship. And I was like, oh, yeah, cool. I don't know what that is. Yeah, yeah, cool, awesome. And, and I was so, uh, forgive me for this sort of phrase. I don't even know where this comes from. I was so gung-ho in that, in that season of my life that I was like trying to interrupt conversations to talk about the two things I knew about Jesus. You know, like I had no Bible background. I remember, I remember the youth group where uh, the youth pastor said that Jesus performed miracles. And I was like, what does that mean? And it's like, he did things that were impossible. And I was like, he did? And it's like, he rose from the dead. And I was like, he did? What? Like, that's amazing. Like, I didn't know any of this stuff. And I was so excited. And I remember in biology class, it was like studying for our final. And my desk was, uh, the teacher's desk was in the back. And my desk was like right next to hers. There was like a little row of three. And I remember turned around. I was talking to this kid behind me and I was trying to tell him about Jesus. And it's all awkward, but I'm so excited, you know. And he's like, okay, yeah, whatever. But I'm just not religious. Religion isn't really for me. And I remember being like, oh, yeah. <laughs> now it's time. I'm going to regurgitate exactly what my youth pastor said. And I was like, here's the thing. It's not a religion. And uh, my fire was quickly blown out when my biology teacher, this worldly, educated, eloquent, articulate woman, pipes in. She's like, what is it then? And I was less enthusiastic, like, uh, it's a relationship with God. And I wish I could end this story with, like, my whole biology class. They started weeping, and they all entered into anti-religion relationship, and revival broke out in our school, and it was this beautiful outpouring, and angel feathers were floating down, and it was powerful. And she just looked at me, and she smiled dismissively, <laughs> and she's like, oh, I see. And I was like, uh, anyways, biology, I'm going to fill out my note card and, and get a C on the final. <laughs> um, and I think in that moment, I've thought about that conversation, if you can tell, I've thought about that conversation so many times over the years. I've thought about that conversation and why it didn't go like I hoped it would go and why my Christian cliche didn't cut to the heart like it did to me. And I started thinking about it. It's like, why doesn't that mean anything to, to Greg, the metal drummer, and Miss Jackson, the biology teacher? And I, I remember over the years, like in, when you're trying to go to bed and you start thinking about embarrassing things, and I remember over the years thinking about that conversation and realizing like, man, I, that was a, a total failure of a witness. It just didn't work like I hoped it would. It didn't work out like I hoped it would. And I just, I've thought about that a bunch and I was like, why didn't that mean anything to them? And, and, I, and I started to challenge myself, like what does that actually mean to me? How could it mean something so special to them if it didn't actually mean anything to me? It just sounds good. There's just those sort of turn of phrase that, that just sound really good. And so I'm like, what does this actually mean? Over the last several weeks, we've been going through a series of teachings um, that uh, Pastor Nate has titled uh, Heresies and Half-Truths. And I think there's something to this because there are things that are subtle that, sleep in, that seep into the way you think about God, uh, seep into the way you think about yourself, that heresy is bad. If you de deny like the sonship of Jesus, the divinity of, of Jesus, if you're denying these, these core things, we have a church word for that that we've borrowed from all of history, that that is bad. That's bad when you deny God who God is. But there's also this other piece that is a half-truth, where it's something that is true, but you can see the end in sight. Do you catch my meaning? Like, it is true, but if you base your life off of this, the thread will run out, and you'll be missing something, and you'll find yourself years down the road thinking, does this mean anything? 
I've spent years telling people this, believing this, writing this in my journal through hard times, through confusing times, relying on this passage, and now I'm not so sure what it actually means. And that was what I would qualify as a half truth. That's something that is true, but if you take it to its full extreme, it will fail you. And that is not truth. <laughs> truth is true. Does that make sense? So it's important to say, like, uh, as, I, as I go into like, my thesis, so to speak, today, it's important to say that I'm not saying that uh, it's not a religion, it's a relationship, it's heresy. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that that is a half-truth. So my, my point, if you'll bear with me, is that religion, in fact, is not the enemy. And it doesn't exist contrary to relationship. And I think this is something that, as evangelicals in the West, we struggle with. Because it's like, there are passages in the Bible that deal with religion. And we're like, what do we do with this? Because there are plenty of passages that deal with religion in a negative sense. But I want to I do a little bit of work this morning. And I, and I believe wholeheartedly that this will encourage your relationship with Jesus. So let's, let's define this, this dirty word, religion. Let's, let's, let's search out its origins and where we're going. Because what happens all the time is that the culture will have a term for something. The church will have a term for the same thing, but they don't line up. That the Bible will define something based on history and the scriptures and the words of the Lord, and the culture will define something differently. That's, that happens all the time. That is part of what it means to be uh, alive today, is, is to interpret these things and make sure that you're, you're listening to the right uh, authorities, and make sure that you're listening to the right sources, that you're not just making things up as you go. But I would argue... Again, bear with me, that the church at large, in general, has let the culture define what religion is for the church. Because religion has become this dirty umbrella, broad term to consider everything that is negative about faith. Because the Pharisees were religious people, right? So that means their religion was wrong, what they were doing was bad, everything about it was, was inappropriate and not in line with God. And so um, when we talk about, when I, when I sit with, with Gregory and I'm talking to him about Jesus, he's like, that's religion and I don't really want anything to do with that. And I, in my infinite wisdom at 16 years old, say like, but it's not. And him and Miss Jackson are like, but it is. And when we begin to define terms with wisdom, when we begin to define terms with consideration and not with cliches, we will see that the word religion in, in the modern context deals so much with doing and earning. And this is not necessarily the way that we would use this word, but it is legalism. That there is this term that already exists and we've just associated if it's religion, it's legalism. And I don't want to be legalistic, and I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to be grouped in with religious people, so let's throw out the proverbial baby with the proverbial bathwater. We are no longer religious people. But I, I'm going to get ahead of myself just a little bit in my notes. I, I just want to confess, after being a youth pastor for a little while, and, and we tried to do missions and, and all these kinds of things, this misunderstanding affects evangelism and discipleship so much. Because we'll invite people into, Jesus is your cosmic buddy, and he really likes you. And then we'll get down the line, and we're like, well, you, you, you kind of can't do those things that you're doing. <laughs> you kind of can't watch those things that you're watching. God doesn't like that. Um, you you kind of can't treat people the way you're treating them. Also, there's these things that you, you do have to do. You have to like read the Bible, and you have to pray, and you have to go to church, and these kinds of things. And people who signed up for Jesus to get them out of hell and to release them from shame and to have a best friend forever now realize, hey, this is religion. You're asking me to do things. And then you, as, as their friend, you're looking at the Bible. It's like, but I just don't know how to interpret the Bible without it making us do things and, and, and prohibiting us from doing other things. 
And then you start to struggle like, am I religious? Do I need to go to like some sort of Alcoholics Anonymous for religion? Like religiousness anonymous? Like what do I do? How do I, how did I accidentally become religion? Because I just want to be obedient to Jesus. And the people who signed up to have a great friend, it's like my friends don't make me change the movies I watch. My friends don't make me get up on Sunday morning and come to a kind of hot room and listen to somebody talk about the Bible. My friends don't do that. My friends go camping. My friends approve of me and they affirm me and they agree with me. And if they don't, they're not my friend. And this thread runs out and people are deconstructing their faith because this Jesus who they thought was their, their therapist and somebody that they could go to and tell their problems, and he'd be like, it's okay, bud. Keep it up. God loves you. Now, they're in the weeds. Because they read crazy stuff like, if you love me, do what I command you to do. They read crazy stuff like, deny yourself. My generation is part and parcel wholly artistic. And the, the essence of artistic expression is express yourself. And the essence of discipleship to Jesus is deny yourself. And so you come to this, this, this crossroads where you're like, well, now what? What do I do? I thought this was freedom. I thought this was truth and the truth would set me free. I don't understand why Jesus is now all of a sudden approving of people's sexual preferences. Or dispro- disapproving. Excuse me, that would be really confusing, especially if you listened to last week. Um, <laughs> that Jesus is, is telling you how to, how to live and how to love and how to express yourself. I don't understand why it's becoming like this. But if we don't give the culture the option of defining this term, and we actually redefine discipleship to Jesus as just that, discipleship, I think it'll actually provide so much freedom for us. Let's look back to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to read 8 and 9 again. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now, I would say, if you found yourself in a Christian community or a Christian church, this is undisputed. This is essential to orthodoxy. That if somebody's trying to tell you, you have to take our our membership class, you have to come to our membership barbecue, then you can be saved. If people are telling you that, that is a different gospel. That is not the gospel. That it has already been accomplished and it has already been uh, fulfilled in Jesus on the cross, that your debt is paid. All you need is to have faith in him, and he gives you the faith to have in him. It is the grace of God that no one can say like, oh yeah, you know, I, I, I completed Bible college, so now I'm saved. That is undisputed orthodoxy. And anywhere you go that is worth going to, that is what they will believe. But in, in, in this, is uh, I have a theory if you could bear through a theory for a moment, because I haven't been around that long. So I, I, don't, I don't have this like deep, like wise cultural commentary. I'll be 30 next year. And so I've been serving Jesus for the last decade or so, plus like maybe like 12, I don't, 2009, I don't really know numbers. <clears throat> I've been trying to follow Jesus for that many years. In the YouTube video, I'll just put a number right there, you know, like <laughs> however many years that is. Um, and I've seen a couple things, but I haven't, I haven't been around for that long. But I have a theory. My theory is that this sort of misunderstanding stems from, at some point, there was a church that existed that had a lot of authority. And they're looking at the commands of the scripture. And they're like, this is so important. So let's try and make people do it. If we could make people look like Christians, maybe they'll accidentally become Christians. If we could make it really hard to be a sinner, maybe people will get saved. And they start enforcing rules, and they start shaming people when they mess up, and they start um, inventing lies, and they start uh, pressing authority, and they start embracing this sort of thing where it's like, we just have to do the right things, 
and then we'll be okay with God. My theory is that that was a church at some point. And maybe you're sitting out there right now and you're like, I've been to that church. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, I, recently, I've been to that church. But my, my second theory, if you'll follow with me for a second theory, past the, the legalistic people, is that my, my theory, and, and I feel a little bit more confident about this one, that's not really the problem we're dealing with anymore. The problem we're dealing with anymore is not that people are trying to earn God's love, but the problem that we're dealing with is that people feel entitled to it. Why wouldn't God love me? I'm awesome. God, uh, God should have saved me because I rule, and he, he kind of needs my help. If, if I can't play, it, like, who would play guitar if I wasn't playing guitar? Like, no wonder God swooped down in that moment that I was feeling a little weak. Like, of course. I have so much dignity. I have so much uh, uh, value to myself, and, and no wonder God wouldn't save me. And you know what's a stone's throw away from that thought process is I don't think I really needed to be saved. I, like, if Jesus loves me so much, I must be pretty, pretty cool. So I'm just, I, I am right with God. And, and suddenly we're at the same result of legalism is I deserve this. And that's not the grace of God, because the grace of God, grace at all, cannot be comprehended on terms of deserving or earning, because then it's not grace. When I get a paycheck every other Tuesday, it's not like, oh, grace, this is so much grace. You know, it's like, I didn't do anything this week. I didn't even think about my job. I didn't even try. You know, it's like, no, I, I want to live with the kind of integrity that what I'm doing every week is proportionate to what I'm being paid. If I felt like I was getting paid too much, does anybody feel like they're getting paid too much in this room? Because we can talk after church. We can find something to do with that extra money if you want. <laughs> but when you're working, you're, you're feeling like, I I'm doing work, and I'm being compensated for the work that I'm doing. But that's not the way grace works. I brought literally nothing to the table, and Jesus gave me everything. So now there seems to be this sort of disparity between, uh, between my love for him and his love for me because he loves me a heck ton more than I love him. And as a person who loves him, that doesn't sit well with me. I want to love him more. And Jesus, in his wisdom and his caringness and his kindness, he's like, I can help you with that. I can show you. If those of you who are married... Have you ever had those sort of interactions with your spouse where uh, you're like, man, I, I just appreciate you so much. I just love you. How can I, how can I show you I appreciate you? And then they tell you. <laughs> Have you ever had that? <laughs> to me, it's a blessing. As a person who doesn't understand, like doesn't respond to cues very well, like a list is a blessing to me. I, I love a list. <laughs> where like uh, a while back, Shelby was like, I always plan stuff. I always plan dates and you never do. I was like, well, you're just way better at it than me. Like, I just don't understand why this is an issue. Like, I just, and, and I sat there, and I remember writing in my prayer journal, it's like, God, help me plan dates. Like, God, help me. Because it's like, I got a list point. I'm going to add it to the, the, the scroll that I keep in, in my <laughs> backpack and, and how to love Shelby. Like, I want to do better. And, and it's one of those things where it's like, the Lord is so kind. The Lord is so gracious that he actually gives us a form. So let's look for a moment. We're going to go across the pond, and we're going to look at what the Oxford English Dictionary says about religion. Are you ready? I have this definition on the screen. The belief, and this is religion, this is the word religion in the current edition of the Oxford English Dictionary, I know because the internet told me. Religion is the belief in and worship of a superhuman controlling power, especially, oh, I put a typo in there. It's supposed to be especially a personal God or gods. Don't blame the media team. That was 100% me. Um, this is vague. This definition is vague, as most definitions are, so they can cover a lot of things. But what we see here is not what we were talking about before. This is not the way your general Western evangelical church talks about religion. Religion is Pharisee stuff. Religion is doing and earning and, and putting credit in your account so God owes you something. That is what religion is to the church, to the world. That is the way we have defined it in the past. But the, what the word actually means is what you do 
when you believe in and worship God. It's like a state of being, it's, it's, a, it's a form, it's a list of activities. And so the essence of religion in this context is actually very similar to what discipleship looks like in the Bible. And if that doesn't sit well with you, it's because we've taken this cliche as, as our personal identity. I'm not a religious person. If you, at 16, before that biology class, if you would have come up to me and be like, hey man, are you religious? I'm like, no way. No way, man. I have a relationship with Jesus. And I would have been stoked that you asked me that question. But if you were to ask me, do you have a form in which you practice your belief and worship of God? I'd be like, heck yeah, I do. I go to church. I read the Bible. Kind of. You know, like, I, yeah, I totally do that. And then they would have had a beautiful gotcha moment. And my cliche would be dissolved because, like, that's religious. Be like, but, 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 but. No, it's not. No, it's not. I'm not religious. But here's the kicker. Because Jesus is not just our cosmic buddy. Jesus is not just some chill guy who wants to make your life better. That he actually is the Lord of everything. If we believe in him as he intends for us to believe in him, he actually is the Lord and where this gets offensive to our, our, our personal preference in who we are, what we consider to be our identity, where this gets offensive is because he is the Lord and he's really good at being the Lord, we can't just do whatever we want. That overlaps very aggressively into worship. We cannot just worship him however we want. That's been said from pulpits loads of times, like worship the Lord in your own way. I think there's probably a place for that. But if you've ever struggled with all of the commands and instructions in the Bible, there's a reason. It's you and me saying to Jesus, we love you, man. We want to love you more. We want to love you better. And he's like, let me help you. Let me show you the way that you're supposed to live. Let me give you a pure and holy religion. That there are plenty of false religions. There's plenty of things that are not true. There's plenty of things that will leave you empty. That will not change your life, will not transform you, will not give you life to its fullest. But Jesus has spoken through the library of scripture to reveal to us a better way. And it is just that, a way. It is a rule of life. It is a code. It is something that we're committed to. And I hope that finds you with a tender heart this morning. That, that doesn't just sound like, you just said we didn't have to earn it. It's not about earning. It's not about doing. It's about being. That when Jesus called out to Lazarus and said, come out of the tomb, there's this really little moment where he He's all wrapped up and he's hopping along and he tells Lazarus' friends, like, will you take those grave clothes off of him so he can, like, walk better? And there's so many of us that are trying to be resurrected in the Lord Jesus and still bound with the grave clothes that he forgave us from. Does that make sense? That's not what that Bible verse is about, but it's a helpful image, I think. So the distinction that I, that I want to make is that we, we don't form this relationship with Jesus based on our opinions and our ideals, but rather on the ideals and the truth of Jesus. And if the word religion just has too much baggage for you, we don't have to do that. But don't go around telling people that you're not religious when you're trying to follow Jesus. <laughs> because if you're trying to obey Jesus, they're going to gotcha, get you, and they're going to tell you, that's religious, man. And it's like, yes, but this is true religion. This is pure religion. Because we're all slaves to something. We're all servants of something. The Bible describes this, this, this yoke of slavery as you're a slave to your own flesh. You can't deny yourself at all. That in your previous life, when you were, when you were without the grace of God, when you were living on your own accord, you were a slave to that accord. And what the Lord offers you is, is the pure way, the true way, what freedom actually is. So when we think about religion, uh, an easy place to go in your mind is James chapter 1. If you would uh, look there with me, it'll be on the screen. 
Or if you want to turn there, you're welcome to. We will go back to Ephesians, so I don't know if you want to stick your thumb in there or something. But let's look at James uh, 1. If, if some of you are familiar with the scripture, this may be familiar to you. This may even be what you are thinking of as we're, as we're saying this, this awful word religion over and over again. Verse 26 says this. James is addressing followers of Jesus. He says, If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Well, good. It ought to be. Pure and undefiled religion. What? In the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. And it's, it's appropriate that the word religion is used here because if you've read the book of James, like, you realize this guy, I don't know, did he meet Paul? Because I'm pretty sure they were both there in Acts 15, but this feels like, this doesn't sound like Ephesians. <laughs> This doesn't sound like Galatians. This sounds different. Because now he's describing religion, and if I'm actually being a good Bible student, I, I'm seeing that he's talking about it in a, in a positive sense. That he's speaking of this, this term as if it can be redeemed from the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious people of the time. It sounds like it's, there's something here that we've altogether dismissed. And you read the book of James, which... Uh, if you haven't, I'll just give you the abridged version. It deals a lot with doing. We're going we're gonna to read from James 3 a little bit later. It deals a lot with doing. And to your anti-religion relationship personality, you're like, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> how, do, how do I interpret this? How do I, how do I not just dismiss this or, or just say I'm confused and highlight it with a Sharpie and don't look at it again? What do I do with this? And what I think it is, is we tend to think that who we are, our identity, is based on what we believe. It's based on what we think. And the Bible has a completely different vision. This is a conversation for another day. But in ancient history, and in the East especially, there was this whole practice that was called Gnosticism that taught very dogmatically that you are a spirit and your body is just weight that you're carrying around. And, and the thread that ends with Gnosticism is do what you want with your body as long as intellectually you're ascending. And this has slowly and carefully crept its, its, its claws into Christianity because we love quotes like, you're not a body, you're a soul that has a body. Have you ever heard that? I think it's wrongly attributed to C.S. Lewis. I don't think he actually said that, but if he did, who cares? He's dead. Whatever, it's over. I disagree. I, I don't think that's what the, the Bible teaches you. I don't think you can read the book of James and think like, oh, my body's just a byproduct. I don't think you can read First and Second Corinthians and be like, God doesn't care what I do with my body. God doesn't care about my ecclesiology, which is a fancy word for what I think about the church. God doesn't care about those things. I experience church when I'm hiking and when I'm fishing. No, you experience you when you're hiking and you're fishing. And you like you more than you like God. I experience God better when I'm alone. And when I'm doing my own thing and I'm listening to my, my music that I like. And, and I just don't like the music at Open Door Church. I just don't like the the way that they make me talk to other people. I just don't like the way they study the Bible. I just don't like these things. It's like, that's fair. But what we're trying to do, and I'm not saying we're the best at it. What we're trying to do is we're trying to do what Jesus said. And forgive us, have grace for us, because we're not perfect either. But we're just trying to do what Jesus said. And there's been many landmarks throughout the history of this church that we've found Jesus saying something and we're not doing it. And we're like, well, shoot. <laughs> we got to start doing this thing that Jesus told us to do. Like, what, what are we supposed to, like, we can't ignore these things. And the book of James makes this anti-religion relationship thing very difficult. But I would argue that Ephesians isn't off the hook either. If we go back to Ephesians 2, look at the end of this section that we read. Let's, let's 
Get excited and read this good thing again. For by grace you have been saved, verse 8 says, through faith and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Praise the Lord, I'm not trying to detract from this whatsoever. That is how salvation works. You had nothing to do with it. It was a gift from a very kind God who intends to show you kindness for the rest of time, forever and ever. Not as a result of works, verse 9 says, so that no one may boast. But look at verse 10. He tops it off with a... With a a, a blaring compliment, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. And look, he gives us a reason. That if you've ever wrestled with, what is the purpose of life? Why, why do I exist? He says, he created us in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. And this language of good works is not something that pastors invented so they could get you to sign up to volunteer in kids' church. I had a conversation with a guy. It didn't go great, but hopefully next Thursday we'll talk about it again, um, about manuscript history. And we have a lot of manuscript history. What that means is where the Bible was translated from. So this isn't like Constantine and his boys were like, yeah. We really like when church has authority over people because we have authority over everyone. So we really want the church to have that too, is the History Channel perspective on this. Um, so we're going to change what the Bible says. When Jesus was saying, like, you do you, we're going to be like, no. He created you for good works that he prepared beforehand because we're evil. <laughs> I would argue that this is actually what the kingdom of God looks like. That if you... Um, have, have missed the descriptions that Jesus gives of the kingdom of God, I remember sitting down with a young man and him being like, i got to be honest, I like Jesus a whole lot, but heaven sounds painful. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> Please, what's, why, why are you saying this? What are you talking about? He's like, I mean, worship is fine, but to do like songs and singing and, and, and guitars and, and vocalists forever, that just sounds awful. <laughs> You know, wouldn't that get boring? And, he, and he's like embarrassed to tell me this because he's a new Christian. He's the only Christian in his family. And I was like, man, I have good news for you. <laughs> There's nowhere in the Bible that describes it like that. <laughs> like that is something that we have invented. I don't know where it came from. Kirk Cameron, maybe. I don't know where it came from. <laughs> Kirk Cameron's fine. He's great. Um, <laughs> I don't think he believes that either. I've, I've listened to his stuff. Um, but, but the idea is that we're, we're signing up for, for life with God. We're signing up for cooperation. When the, the Bible describes heaven, it describes a city. It describes trees. It describes coming and going. It, des it describes interactions with each other. It describes life and life in its purest, most beautiful form with Jesus as the universal Lord of everything. Where everything works the way he designed it to work. And when we pray your kingdom come, that's what we're asking for. Jesus, do what you want to do. Jesus, actually be in charge. I think that this idea of being religious in its purest form is actually what the kingdom of God looks like. That if you've ever struggled with the, the expectations of a disciple that you've ever struggled with the way that the Lord talks to his disciples and expects things of them. I just want to free you. If you've ever been embarrassed and been like, I feel strongly about this, I'm convicted about this, but I don't want my friends to think I'm like legalistic or holier than thou. I don't want to put people down. It's like the Lord is ordering our lives according to his word. That is actually what he wants. And he has plenty of grace for us that we can... We can stumble through this thing and he'll forgive us and he'll lift us up and he'll correct us and he'll discipline us and all these things will take place and it's good and it's holy and it's right. Look at this quote from E.K. Simpson in his commentary about uh, this a chapter in Ephesians. This was written in like 1958, I think, so if there are words in here that don't make a whole lot of sense, uh, bear with me. They talked differently back then, apparently. <laughs> good works are never to be relied on as items placed to our credit in the running account with our supreme creditor. Yet they are indispensable testifications, not a word, <laughs> we, that no longer exists as a word, of love and gratitude, gratitude to an untold benefactor, and you can tell he's from Europe, savior, savior. Um, 
And, and the reason that I include this quote is, is to correctly align what is happening. What is happening is that we're not earning something. We're not like positioning ourselves for God's favor, but we're responding to his favor. That we've already been given the grace of God in immeasurable amounts, and our response is to obey the one who has grace towards us. Martin Luther, who came way later, or way earlier, excuse me, um, said it in an even simpler way, but it was German, so it probably sounded a lot cooler in German. It is not against works that we contend. This is the Protestant guy. This is the guy who's like hammering statements against the church in Rome and, and, and the establishment that was so corrupt in the time. He's, he's uh, starting reformation and revolution that we don't earn our way to heaven. He's, he's reviving these theologies that had been buried by dogma that was inappropriate. And he says, it's not against works that we contend, but against trust in works. That your works do not solidify your position with God, but they are your response to God. And why does this matter? I have this section in every sermon that I write because I, confession time, I'm prone to semantics. I love confession. This is a character flaw. Don't hate me. I love when I hear people and they're wrong. And I get to be like, well, actually. <laughs> It's a flaw. I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm working on it. This is not semantics. This is not like, well, that's already what I think. So you're just telling me something that I already know and making me use a word I don't like. With all cliches, there is the looming potential to overemphasize a point. And even that phrase right there probably has a point that can be overemphasized. But just like legalism takes something that is good, that is good works and doing the things that Jesus said, and overemphasizes it, this anti-religion relationship club can overemphasize the, the necessity of communication and relationship and make this thing about me rather than about him. And on this verge, we can make church worship, any form of ser serving, we can make it a servant to our own personality, to our own preferences and our own comfort. And we're looking to be self-actualized like those dirty millennials rather than to be servants of Jesus. Does that make sense? This is a fear that I have, and this is a place that I think the church at large is going or already arrived. Look at John 14 with me. Verse 12, this is Jesus in the hours before his arrest, addressing his closest disciples, his closest friends, addressing them about the most important things. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And uh, it, for those of you visiting us, we do align ourselves with an ongoing ancient biblical tradition that is Pentecostalism, that we believe the Holy Spirit does the stuff that he did in the Bible, healing bodies, um, prophecy, those kinds of things. We believe in that, and, and we're not, like, shy about it. We want to be biblical about it. I think that's what makes us not look like other Pentecostals. Um, <laughs> we want to be biblical. And so we read this verse. It's like, brother, the works that Jesus did, you'll do greater works. That means heal the sick, raise the dead. That means prophecy and wisdom and healing and Pentecost and, and flags and, and trumpets. And that, that's Jesus, yes. But what we don't realize is what he's talking about is justice and kindness and mercy. And he's saying this is now the yoke of your life. That the sacrifice that Jesus gave, as he says in the very next chapter, that there's no greater love than this for a man to lay down his life for his friends. That your life no longer belongs to you, but it belongs to him. This is what he means when these works that I did, where I came to serve and not to be served, that's what you're going to do. 
That's why he caps it off with this like weird thing. If you love me, you'll do what I told you. Command sounds maybe gentler. I don't know. <laughs> but like what he's saying is like all these things I've shown you through my whole life, you're going to do them. And that's the only way that you'll show the, that you love me. And if you're not doing these, I would argue with you that you don't actually love me. And I want you to hear this this morning as an arrow through my heart that I can see the holes, man. That's the problem with studying the Bible is you begin to be acutely aware of how much you're not like Jesus. And so I'm not here telling you it's like, be like me, be like Jesus. That's not what I'm saying this morning, but I'm saying is we're all in this together. That we're all in this to conform our lives, not to our personalities or what the Enneagram tells us or what we've always done in our tradition. And, and I'm like my dad and boys will be boys. None of that matters in light of the cross of Jesus. That we have died with him and we are raised with him. Look at this. This is wild. 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5 is a beautiful chapter. This is... Uh, walk by faith, not by sight. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful chapter. And right in the middle, Paul decides, as he's elaborating on the argument of, of God's authority and what he's doing, he decides to use this outrageous wording. Look at verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us. <laughs> I can't be controlled. I'm a bucking bronco on the frontiers of Colorado. I'm a wild man. I can't be controlled. It's like, no, this is God's plan. Apparently, having concluded this, that one died for all, that being Jesus. Therefore, all have died. Verse 15, he died for all. Look at this glaring, obvious, painful, offensive, so that. He died for all. Praise God, brother. We're forgiven. So that. Wait. His reason isn't just that I'm super awesome. And he loves me so that they who live might no longer live for themselves. But for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Isn't that wild? That this is essential to our Christology is that the reason that Jesus died is so that we could live for him. And Paul, who's pretty smart, leads the statement with, no longer living for yourself, but living for him. Now, the caveat that always needs to happen in these kind of conversations is that God doesn't hate your happiness. God doesn't want you to not have hobbies and to be like this ascetic monk weird thing or something like that. God's okay if you enjoy like eating dinner with your family and you go camping sometimes. God's okay with that. I think God came, like Jesus came so that you would have life to the fullest. I don't think he's mad when you're enjoying yourself. But if we take the, the greatest and foremost commandment seriously to love the Lord with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves, this needs to be something that is, is really important to us. That we no longer live for ourselves, but we live for him who died. That in our aim to follow Jesus, it's not open to endless interpretations. That we're actually subjecting ourselves to him as the Lord. And I, and I would argue this, and, and I think this is means for greater conversations and other conversations. The greatest interpretive uh, liberty that we're given is that Jesus lived a long time ago, pretty far away. And so it's just not going to look exactly the same. So as I'm saying this, if you're sitting there armed crossed and be like, oh, are you expecting me to be a single Jewish itinerant preacher? No. That's not what it means. That's not what I think Jesus was trying to accomplish with the disciples that he worked with in his incarnation. What I think he was raising up as the tradition of disciples work, that if I wanted to become an electrician, are there any electricians in the house? No. Okay. Bad example. Um... <laughs> If you wanted to become an electrician, nobody wants to hire a, a hobby electrician. Can you, can you validate me there? Nobody wants to hire somebody like, yeah, I dabble in electricity. Like I could, <laughs> let me take a whack at your house. Like, let's, see, let's see what we can do. Uh, <laughs> but they, they, they hire a master electrician. And you know how one becomes a master electrician? You apprentice with a master electrician. 
And at the end of your apprentice, apprenticeship, you don't just be like, all right, your way was cool, but I've got this wild new way. What if every appliance was 220? Toasters, ceiling fans, everything's 220. Everything's super powered, let's do it. You're a bad apprentice. <laughs> but when you apprentice under the master, my initial thought was uh, tattooing, because I know that's the way tattooing works, is that you're, but people let random people tattoo them all the time. So <laughs> maybe that's not a good example. But electricity is a lot more uh, shocking. And it's <laughs> but um, but um, <laughs> the point is that if we intend to be disciples of Jesus, which I hope that you do, then we have to follow the way of the master. If we just try and start interpreting this as, it's, as if it's up to our interpretation, then we are misrepresenting the values of the Lord. This is the distinction. This is the emphasis. There's a, a late author and, and uh, professor of um, philosophy, Dallas Willard, who had this quote. Got it. There is no avoiding the fact that we live at the mercy of our ideas. This is never more true than with our ideas about God. Meaning well is not enough. Those who operate on the wrong information are likely never to know the reality of God's presence in the decisions which shape their lives and will miss the constant divine companionship for which their souls were made. I love that, that section, meaning well is not enough. If we look at James chapter 2, this is, this is closing. <clears throat> James chapter 2, uh, we're going to read a, a little bit of a section here, but I think um, I'm not going to necessarily expand on every idea, but I want you guys to get the full breadth of what we're talking about. We're going to start in verse 14. James is again addressing the followers of Jesus with just really aggressive things and uh and this is james who if you're if you're into like bible and languages his name probably wasn't james isn't that fascinating all like manuscripts that we have his name is jacob and then when we translated it in english i guess king jimmy across the pond decided let me just throw my name in there i don't know how it works that's just what i read so anyways but this this character jacob is actually pretty important because uh he was uh, Jesus' brother. <laughs> so, like, uh, he uh, knew the ins and outs, and, and Jesus confessed openly in the Gospels that, in his own biographies, that his brothers did not believe in him or trust him while he was living. Can you imagine having an older brother like Jesus? Can you imagine the comparison that is given? Like, why can't you be more like your brother? But after the resurrection, we don't get a record of it, but something happened where James is like, wow. All those years, he was telling the truth. And something ignited in James's heart that he's addressing the entire council of the church in Jerusalem in Acts 15 with important, important things concerning the salvation of the Gentiles. He has been transformed into a completely different person. And all of this to say, I think we can trust him when he says that he's been inspired by the Holy Spirit and he writes this letter for us to believe and us to follow. Verse 14, what use is it, my brethren? Brethren is an important thing. This is not for lost people. This is for people who are considered our brothers and sisters in Christ. This is for people in the church. If someone says he has faith but has no work, works, can faith save him? And you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Have you even met Paul? Yes, faith, grace, this stuff. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace and be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But some may well say, you have faith, I have works, show me your faith without works, I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. Verse 20, but if you are willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, now he's being mean, that faith without works is useless, was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, 
As a result of the works, faith was perfected. And scripture was fulfilled, which says, and Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. There's a lot there, you guys. And I don't want to misrepresent this passage. That's one of my big pet peeves is just using Bible verses to mean what you want them to mean. But it's hard to extract any meaning out of this without the essential principle that God deeply cares about what you do. That you can think the right thoughts, but what you actually believe is what you do. Does that make sense? That I can believe, we've used this example for, before, so don't get exhausted with this. If I believe that this is a sturdy chair, I'm telling my friends about it. I'm telling my coworkers, this chair, primo, it's a good chair. If you came, if you visited, and you sat in that chair, you'd be like, wow, this is a chair. It's solid construction. It's holding itself together. There's space underneath. If you like to tuck your feet under the chair, it's, it's a really solid, safe chair. It won't hurt you. And I never have ever sat in the chair. I don't actually believe that it's true. If, if you come up to me and be like, man, I, it looks like a good chair. Sure. Will you, will you try it on for me? Will you, will you test drive this chair for me? I, I use this example with driving. You cannot say that you are a good driver. Because in your mind, you may be a good driver. And everybody who's ever driven with you, if they disagree, you are not a good driver. Does that make sense? If I will not actually, if I'm afraid of sitting in the chair, but I'm telling you it's a good chair, it doesn't matter what I think. It matters what I do. And so if I believe that Jesus cared about the poor and the oppressed and the, 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 the weak and the, the lost, if God cares about those things, if God cares about church and God cares about Bible and God cares about correct interpretations and, and prayer and these different things, but I never interact with any of it, I don't actually believe it. And I heard a pastor once, and he was describing this relationship with like an older mentor that he had. And he's just in this meeting with this mentor and like, man, I'm going to extract all the value out of this. This guy's been pastoring for decades. I'm going to get all the nuggets of wisdom. I'm going to reshape them and bring them to my church. I'm gonna, it's going to be awesome. And the, the, the mentor just sits down with him. He's like, you don't need any more insights. He's like, whoa, I must be pretty smart. He's like, no, you just need to practice the insights that you already say you believe. And it's like, we, I, I believe that there's a great trend of biblical literacy in the church today. But if we just start with practicing the things that we know to be true, like loving God and loving our neighbors, we will be practicing pure and undefiled religion. We don't need more insights. We don't need more cultural commentaries. We need to actually practice the ones that we already say we believe. We said it a couple times, and I hope this is helpful language for you if you guys are monopoly players out there. But God's grace is not a get out of hell free card. But it is an invitation and a release from that bond of sin to live the way that Jesus actually intended you to live. Now, there's a guy, again, this is an old one, so if the words are kind of confusing, ask questions. W.G. Blakey, he has two quotes here. His commentary on this section, excuse me, specifically talking about this section in Ephesians, talking about good works that were prepared beforehand. He starts with this, this phrase. He says, anything right in us is not the cause of grace, but its fruit. I feel like that's a great way to look at what it means to obey the commands of Jesus. That it's not that we're earning God's grace, but it is actually the effect that God's grace has on us. He expounds on it. Look at this. Before the foundation of the world, it was ordained that whoever should be saved by grace should walk in good works. The term walk in, in Ephesians 2, verse 10, here denotes habitual tenor of life. It is spent in an atmosphere of good works. 
Here we have divine safeguards against the abuse of the doctrine of salvation by grace. When men hear of salvation, irrespective of works, they are apt to fancy that works are of little use and do not need to be carefully attended to. On the contrary, they are part of the divine decree. If we are not living a life of good works, we have no reason to believe that we have been saved by grace. And, and, I, and I bring this, and I bring this that it's not just my opinion or, or my kooky interpretation of scripture, that this commentator wrote this in like the mid to late 50s through the lens that people are going to start, people are already and going to start abusing the grace of God. So this isn't like, man, our great American values are being abandoned. It's like, no, this has been going on since Corinth was a church. This has been going on for a long time. And I just want to warn us and encourage us to live a life approved and worthy of the grace that we've been given. Because we're not earning our position with God, but from that position, we're operating. From that position, we're doing the things that he called us to do. I'm not into your lives. I'm not into your